prevented by SOLA. How do you seamlessly transition from your successful crowdfunding campaign to your own platform? SOLISTAR is the solution. Download a free step-by-step -step guide on what to do before, during, and after crowdfunding success. Over $244 million has been contributed to video game projects on major crowdfunding platforms since 2012. When this campaign ends, developers face a new challenge, transitioning to a successful long-term business. Learn how to get a bigger piece of the pie for your own pre-order campaign with your own solar star. This free solar guide includes simple practices to drive pre-order campaigns along with success stories where teams utilize the best in class tech stack for game developers. Let producer Joe McCoy discusses the development of Apex Legends. Eurog recently published an interview with Respawn Entertainment. Let producer Joe McCoy, who discusses the development behind the Tax Legends, a new battle royale game set in Reci, and how it came to fruition. They coined right from the beginning that the idea of Apex Legends Plus going to be hard to sell to PLAYRSINITALAY, which explains the secrecy of its launch and minimal marketing to push the game. Our desire is to be completely open and transparent with our player base, and part of that expands to how we talk about problems, and we understand this game is gonna have a skeptical audience. The coin explains, after all, Many players were expecting a sequel to Titanfall 2. There are some people who think there are too many Battle Royale games. How is stuff at? The world thinks we are making Titanfall 3 and we are not. This is what we are making. To try and convince a skeptical audience for months with trailers and hands-on articles. We are just like, let the game speak for itself. It's the most powerful antidote to potential problems. He continues, we are doing a free-to-play game, with essentially loot boxes, after we were bought by, and it's not Titanfall 3, it's the perfect recipe for a marketing plan to go or die. So why have that let's just ship the game and let players play? McCoy also describes the challenge of designing a battle royale game. Without C-E-R-T-A-I-N-T-I-T-A-N-F-A-L-L-P-I-E-C-E-S, namely the Titans, the decision to forego specific abilities, our items ultimately came down to the difference in goals between the car Titan 4 games and the new Battle Royale. When we started the Apex Legends, we were building of Titan 4 2, and we did not know we were not going to have double jump, or while running our Titans. McCoy says, the choice do not have those came about because of playtesting against our goals. Do you have a strategic, learnable, masterable, deep game? Be sure to read the entire piece over at Eurogamer, which provides some more detail about the development of Apex Legends. A few months back, I played around with, yet again, rebuilding a half-finished, Metroidvania-style game. I have played around with off and on over the years. One of my goals in this experiment was to use base unity functionality as much as possible, replacing 2D toolkit and custom systems as much as possible. One of the prime candidates for such a rewrite was the menu system. If it's not immediately obvious from the screenshot to the right, that's essentially a vertical menu with items that have horizontal behaviors. When equipment is selected, you can choose an item to use or equip on the horizontal axis. When a volume slider is selected, you can adjust the value with the horizontal axis. Importantly, the game's intended to be played with a gamepad, so I did not want the presence or absence of mouse. A touch input to affect this behavior. Unity OV navigation is pretty smart and got me most of the way there. 
If you have focused on mouse touch interface when building your OI, good news, if it's a grid ish format, it probably works the way you did expect. That's thanks to your selectable objects like buttons have a navigation property. By default, this is set to automatic, which again, that's the right thing in most cases. Unity uses each object's position to determine which object will be selected when navigating up, down, left, or right. This is basically how controller navigation works. You are building a large chain of objects, which can connect, drop, to your far other objects. Helpfully, there's a visualize button which overlays yellow arrows indicating these connectors. Aside from automatic, the other navigation options are explicit requires a bit of micromanagement. So it's best to use it only if one of the other options does not give you what you want. It's also, as we will see, something you can manipulate in scripts, which is helpful for generating menus on the fly, a swapping behaviors. The selectable class, the basis for several Unity OV components, and something you can inherit from for your own components, define set navigation type, set up, set down, set lift, and set right methods for changing navigation properties. Another bit of Unity OV magic, I took advantage of was the collection of selectable interfaces, specifically in select handler. ID select handler and the cancel handler. Each of these interfaces has one method. If your model's behavior implements one of these interfaces, Unity will pass certain UE related events to it. All of these methods accept a single event data parameter, which may be a different subclass depending on where it's used. Depending on what you are doing, you may need to call its use. Method to get correct behavior. This signals to Unity that you are handling the event in your code, rather than relying on Unity's default behavior. Our main stupid unit trick is rewiring navigation on the fly to build submenus. My equipment submenu is implemented as a submenu container class, which contains multiple submenuatum objects. The submenu itself is not selectable. It's simply a manager for the items which are defined in the component. The submenu also knows a few other things, such as which items are previous and next for the submenu, and what the currently selected item is. For example, my submenu above knows that is the first item in the vertical list, and is followed by the sound slider. It works a little like the old PlayStation system menu, except rotated to radians. I should mention that my equipment submenu is an easy case, since it's a measured area. I know all of the objects a player might ever have, and I have hard-coded them into the menu game objects. The code's a little complex, partially because I try to abstract it enough to be reusable. So if you want to follow along, it's at https bitbitquit or snippets dylan of 5x90. When the submenu loads, I prep all of the submenu items by setting their navigation type to explicit using the set navigation type method of selectable. Then, I iterate through each submenu items as follows. To do this, I implement a select handler and I do select handler on the submenu item. On selection, the submenu item does a couple of things. On the selection, the submenu item changes the button image to a grayed out, inactive image. This way, the player can see which item is selected, but knows the focus is elsewhere in the menu. I did not actually need to write any code to get the volume sliders to work right with controller navigation. Setting only the sliders of pound down navigation properties is left and right available to adjust the value when it's selected. However, I do not want the player to have to click the slider to select it. I'd like to allow the player to click anywhere in the sound. Oh, 
music, block, to do this, I created a simple reader actor class. It's a selectable that uses the non-navigation type, so it cannot be selected with the controller. However, if the player clicks it, a pointer down is fired, which sends the focus to the slider. I apply this to the parent to e element that contains both the sound, our music, label, the selection frame, and only slider. When anything in that area is clicked, it passes the selection down to the slider. This is another problem that would not happen with the controller, but becomes an issue if the mouse or touch screen is involved. Unity's default behavior is to clear selection when the player clicks outside of the selectable object. Normally this is expected. It's not fundamentally different from how most Windows applications behave. But in a controller-only game, recovering from a string click could fail during. It's not hard to prevent this by adding the following component, which remembers the last selected object and forces the event system to reset it if it ever becomes null. Because I am deactivating the entire in-game menu object tree, when the menu closes and gameplay resumes, I do not have to add any extra logic. When the menu is closed,